We've been uh, teaching through the minor prophets in the Old Testament. And if you have your Bibles tonight, we're going to be in the prophet Jonah. Jonah. Uh, I've entitled it The Hateful Prophet. Now, to us it would seem strange that uh, a prophet of God would have hatred in his heart, but there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lesson and a story in, in the prophet Jonah. He's the first minor prophet that we've been looking through the other prophets, Joel and, and Hosea and Obadiah and so forth and Amos. And we said that all these prophets so far have had, uh, have had visions of things that haven't happened yet. That their scope was beyond their time and really even beyond our time. They looked to the millennial kingdom and the second return of Christ they looked at that. Jonah is the first one that doesn't go that far. His, his story really is like a local one. But it does have a significance, we're going to see in a minute, that there is a significance to the story of Jonah. <laughs> it really is prophetic of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He referred to that, and we'll read that uh, shortly. But uh, the lesson of Jonah... I think really speaks to all of us. Because God asked Jonah to do something that he didn't want to do. And he had a reason for not wanting to do it. Some people have tried to write this prophecy off as like a fairy tale because of the, you know, the, the story that we'll get to. You know, Jonah was swallowed by a big fish. And, you know, that, you know, I can remember as a little kid looking in the books and seeing little Jonah in a big whale, you know. In, you know, in behind the teeth were like bars, you know, it was like this. And, and um, if, you, if you look, if you get on the Internet and look, there have actually been instances of people being swallowed by fish and being found later, okay? But that's beside the point. It's, there's, a, there's a story in Jonah, and they've tried, to write, they've tried to write this prophecy off, and they've tried to make Jonah just like a fairy tale or folklore. But Jesus referred to Jonah. So if Jesus referred to him, I guess, if he believed it in the prophet Jonah, I guess maybe we can too, huh? Because I don't think he got this wrong. Let's just start reading <clears throat> a little bit. Now, we don't know a whole lot. Uh, uh, we know a little bit about Jonah. He lived during the time, during the reign of Jeroboam II, who was a king of the northern kingdom. That would put him about the same time as Joel or Amos, okay? Um, and he is actually referred to in another place in Scripture, over in 2 Kings, you might want to just put your finger there in, uh, well, let me, let me fl flick my, if it works. Okay, okay. Uh, over in, in 2 Kings, chapter 14, and just, just, to, just to see where Jonah's coming from here, okay. 2 Kings, chapter 14, and... Uh, and, and look at verse uh, 25. In 2 Kings? Oh, I'm looking at chapter 15. Wait a minute, maybe that has something to do with it. 14. Okay, okay, thank you. I was looking at chapter 15. There's was only one off. So I was right. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Just imagine. It would be like, you know, only like the first mistake I made in the last three years, but that's all right. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Okay. My wife will say, yeah, he's kidding. All right. All right. Uh, okay. It says, um, look, look, at verse, uh, look at verse 23, just to read into it. In the 15th year of Amaziah, a son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria and reigned 40 and 1 years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, which they all did in Samaria. All the northern kingdom kings did that. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who made Israel to sin. He restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain. Now this king, this wicked king of the northern kingdoms, he has some military success according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spoke by the hand of his servant who? Jonah, okay? The son of Amittai, the prophet which was uh, of Gath Hefer. For the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, that it was very bitter, for there was none any shut up, nor any left, nor any helper for Israel. So uh, Jonah had prophesied the expansion of the northern kingdom. He had prophesied that uh, the, the, this wicked king of the northern kingdom would be militarily successful. 
So, when we go to Jonah chapter 1, just keeping that in, in mind, it says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. His mission... If it works. His mission was to go to Nineveh. Maybe if I move this stand, I'll be in better, better shape. Now, if you know anything about Nineveh, if you've ever read about Nineveh, they were mean. They were mean. I mean, they were, they were mean. If Nineveh conquered a nation, they were, nobody wanted to be conquered by Nineveh. You know, it's like in, in, in World War II, toward the end of World War II, all the German soldiers, they wanted to be captured by the Americans and not by the Russians. Because they knew they'd be treated a whole lot better. The Ninevites, nobody wanted to be captured by the Ninevites. And it's, it's pretty safe to conjecture this, that Jonah, being a good Israelite, prophesying the expansion of, of the nation of Israel, the last thing in the world he wanted to do was go save Nineveh. If it was up to him, he'd see him swallowed up in the ground with an earthquake. Because nobody liked Nineveh. They were evil. They were bitter enemies of Israel. So God said, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now, I've got a little, just so you get an idea of where this is. I'll see the little light work. There it is. Okay, there's, there's Jerusalem there. You see, see, see Jerusalem? And Nineveh is way up here, right around where uh, Iraq and Iran would be. Uh, Iraq, particularly, there's Nineveh, okay? So, God said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to preach to them. I want you to tell them to repent because they're evil, okay? So what did Jonah do, like a good little prophet? Did he head toward Nineveh? No, he didn't head toward Nineveh. What did he do? He hated him. So, he went as far in the opposite direction as he could go. He didn't just like hang out or just... He, he said, listen, Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish, which is like Spain. So not only did he not go to Nineveh, but he got in a boat and he went the absolute 180 degree opposite direction. <laughs> now here's a prophet of God. He had heard from the Lord. God had used him. Why did he turn? Because he didn't want to see the Ninevites saved. Listen, if there's ever a message to the church and the people that sit up, and there have been folks been sitting up in church for years and years and years. They don't want to see no sinners come in their church. I'm going to tell you something. If we don't see sinners come in here, <laughs> that's, that's the future. You know what? Save sinners. That's the future of the church. I was thinking of, you know, these kids hanging out in, in our neighborhoods. You know, we want to we call 911. But wouldn't it be better if we called upon the Holy Spirit to maybe give us a vision? And believe me, I've been there. You all know some of you know, where I live. Okay. I understand the frustration. I understand sometimes, you, you know, you want to see people get busted. And sometimes that's what they need. I've known folks who got busted go to jail and get saved in jail. You know, sometimes that's what happens. But sometimes we get so, we get so vengeful. You know, Jonah, he says, I'm not preaching to them Ninevites. I hate them. Who's the hateful prophet? So he went to flee from the presence or the face of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. If God tells you to do something and you decide you're going in the opposite direction, God's not going to let you go. He's not going to let you go. Look what happened. We all know what happened. I think we, most of us know the story. He says, <laughs> but the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea and there was a mighty tempest 
in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners, these hardened seafaring men who had been in storms before, had never seen one like this. The perfect storm, right? They were afraid and cried every man unto his God. And they cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. That's what they would do. If you remember the story when, when Paul's ship was in the storm uh, in, in the book of Acts. They got rid of the stuff to lighten it up so they wouldn't be burdened down so they could bear the storm. When all this was going on, Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship. And he was taking him a nap. He went down to, take, he went down to sleep. He knew what was going on. You see, Jonah, listen, listen to, listen to this. You know, Jonah was willing to die instead of preach to his enemy. He knew what was happening. He knew who God was. Okay, now look what it says. Reading out here a little bit. Verse 6. So the shipmaster came to him and said, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon your God, if so be that God will think upon us, that we perish not. You know, they were all praying to their gods, whoever they might be. And they said, buddy, he said, you're in this ship too. You better start praying. And they came and said, everyone to his fellow, come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. They realized, they were spiritual enough to realize that what was happening to them wasn't a natural storm. But there was a reason why they were in such a tumult. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. And they said unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is your occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? Why is this happening to us? And when he said unto them, I am a Hebrew... And I fear the Lord, Yahweh, the God of heaven, which has made the sea and the dry land. And when they heard that, they said, oh, we heard of that God. We heard of that God. We heard about what happened down in Egypt when he brought them out. We heard about what he did to the, to the Amorites and the Hittites and all the ites in, you know, in the promise. We heard about that. We heard about what happened in Jericho. We heard about all the great things he's done. We heard about King David, King Saul. We heard about what God has done. Oh, that God. I don't want to mess with that God. They were exceeding afraid. And they said to him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he told them. He said, he said, I'm running from God. You know, we think that when we run from God, it just affects us. But it affects everybody around us. If you've got a family and you're running from God, it's going to affect them. If you got where you're in your church, in your circle of friends, Wherever you operate, if you run from God, it's not just affecting you. Because when God has a calling on your life, and, and you're willfully disobeying, we're not talking about just walking around and wondering, oh God, Jonah knew what God wanted him to do. It was very clear. When God calls you to do something and you don't do it, man, anybody been there? I've been there a few times. I think back. When God had told me one thing or another, and I said, nah, I ain't doing that. I wish I could go back and change it, okay? But it affects, it brings about a, a, a storm, a mighty wind. He told him, he says, I'm fleeing from the face of God. I'm running from him. I don't like the assignment he gave me. Then they said unto him in verse 11, what shall we do unto you, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth. Listen, he was willing to die 
instead of be obedient to God. Wow. He must have had him some hatred for the Ninevites. He must have really didn't want to go to that city. He said, throw me overboard, boys. He says, I'm at fault. He said, take me up, cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that it is for my sake that this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard because they didn't want to mess with the prophet of God. They rode hard to bring it to the land. But nothing, anything they did, it was, it was not enough to stop the storm. The sea was wrought and was tempestuous against them. Verse 14. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord, and they said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life. They were, they were asking forgiveness for throwing him overboard. Lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. They said, Listen, Lord, you've sent this storm on us because of this man. So let our hands be clean. Okay? Now. Nah. So they took up Jonah, and they cast him forth into the sea, and the sea immediately calmed, ceased from raging, right? Okay. And they offered, then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows, okay? Now, verse 17. The Lord had prepared a great fish. Again, we've talked about this and people have tried to make a mockery of this. And it, notice it doesn't say a whale. Okay. It says a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Again, this, this has become a children's tale, but we're going to see in a little bit that this is very significant. Chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed. Under the Lord his God, out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell I cried, and thou heard my voice. Now, if you read different commentators and you, and you talk to different ministers, some will say that Jonah was, you know, God put him in a fish and the fish spit him out on land. But I believe, and I believe it, it backs, the, the scriptures back us up, that Jonah died in the belly of that fish. I mean, graveyard dead. He died in the belly of that fish. He was dead. And when he came to, when he was revived, he gave thanks to God. He says, For you have cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, in verse 3, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. Said He prayed, he said, Lord, you've put me in the belly of this fish, but I know, Lord, you have a purpose for me. I'm going to see your temple again. The waters compassed me about, even to, to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was around me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. What we see here, according to Jesus, is a picture of the death of the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because when they said, Jesus, show us a sign, when the, when the Pharisees and the scribes and the hypocrites said, Jesus, show us a sign, he said, there's only one sign I'll give you. That's the sign of the prophet Jonah. Okay. It says, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. That they, observe, they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spoke unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. So, Jonah had made a vow unto God. He was a prophet. And he ran from the face of God. God got him into a place where he said, I'm going to keep my promise. See, 
This picture, and again, Jonah doesn't look to the future, but it looks to right now. It looks to the lives of believers. When we turn our backs on God, you know what? If you really belong to him, he's not going to let you go. He'll put you where he wants you to be. He'll put you through anything he needs to put you through to get you to the place where you'll say, yes, I'm going to keep my promise. Have you ever made a promise to God? If you're really his, he's going to make sure you keep it. Just like with Jonah. The fish vomited him out on dry ground. And he was back to square one. Here we go now, Jonah. If you would have done it the first time, you would have missed the, the you know, all-expense-paid trip in the belly of a fish. So the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Arise, it's the same thing. God didn't change his mind. The same message. Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So this time Jonah didn't waste any time. He went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. Most people believe that that term means it would take three days to walk all around the city. It was a a major city. It was a big city. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey and cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be thrown. Now, Now just imagine this. Here's this Hebrew who the Ninevites would have hated. Walking through a city that he hated amongst people that he would just as soon have seen swallowed up in the earth. A a nation and the people who were an obstacle to his nation's success. Yet he's walking through the city and basically he's saying repent. He's preaching a message to them that if they listen to it and heed it will save them from destruction. Now, the people of Nineveh could have said, who's this guy? They could have taken him and thrown him to the crocodiles. But see, Jonah was anointed. His word was anointed. His word had power. Because it wasn't his word, it was God's word going through him. God's word was going through him in spite of him. You know, sometimes God will use you in spite of yourself, okay? Now listen, they believed God. When they, heard, when they heard Jonah's preaching, they believed God. And they proclaimed the fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. That word of God. See, some folks say, man, people today won't believe God's word. Listen, if it's anointed, they'll believe it. If it's given by God, if it's blessed by God, they'll believe it. People say, these kids in these streets, nobody's going to reach them. God will reach them. You don't have to be clever. You don't have to dress it like them. You don't have to act like them. I ain't going to try to act like a 22-year-old. Don't have to. All you got to do is shed the love of Jesus abroad in your heart and, be, and ask God for an anointing and preach God's word. That's all, that's all it, it takes. Pray for their hearts to be broken, to receive the seed. Not just the kids here, but the people in your family and your parents and the ones who are stubborn and the ones who are atheists. Pray that God will break their hearts. And when you plant that seed, it'll go down and it'll start to take root. So we pray for on Thursday nights when Brother Jerry said, we pray for God to break hearts. Okay, now. The king in verse 7 caused it to be proclaimed and published. Throughout Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. They proclaimed a fast. Even the animals didn't eat. My dog went like that. <laughs> but they were serious. They heard God's word, and they listened. They said, man, we're in trouble. Jonah ne- probably never thought that would happen. Jonah probably thought, and I'm, I'm just reading this, and you know, this is just my opinion, but I believe if I would have been Jonah, I would have thought, man, I'm going to go to Nineveh, and they're going to want to kill me. They ain't going to listen to me. They ain't going to listen to me. My family's not going to listen to me. Kids in the street ain't going to listen to me. The drug dealers ain't going to listen to me. Listen, if you go in the power of God, it's not you that's speaking. It's God that's speaking. 
They didn't listen. They didn't see this, this ratty old prophet that spent three days in the belly of a fish. That's not who they were looking at. They heard the voice of God when he was speaking. Let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Verse 9, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish? God's not going to, Barack Obama won't listen. Congress won't listen. Supreme Court won't listen. Listen, when the word of God comes, somebody's going to listen. Somebody's going to listen. There's, no, there's nothing beyond hope. There's no one beyond hope. Somebody's going to listen. Verse 10. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. God had mercy. Now, if you follow history... A number of years later, another generation of Ninevites came along and they forgot about this. But God stayed his hand this time. Now, you would think when, if, if you ever led somebody to the Lord, or you got a chance to pray with somebody or experienced, you know, somebody got a healing or you say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Well, thank you, Lord. Jonah didn't do that. In fact, Jonah copped an attitude. It says, it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. <laughs> I love Jonah. Okay. And he prayed unto the Lord, and he said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying? I told you, I knew you, was, I knew you would save him. I knew you'd do this. <laughs> Therefore, I fled before unto Tarshish, for I know that you're a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repentance thee of the evil. Now listen, have you ever known anybody? Now, now just be honest with yourself. Have you ever known anybody that got saved and you thought to yourself, Uh, you might as well be honest with you. You don't have to answer that to me, you know. It's just, it's... <laughs> okay. Jonah was kicking, man. He says, I, knew, I, knew, I know you're merciful. I know you have great kindness and you repent. They repented you of, of the evil you're going to do to them. Therefore, now, O oh Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. I, I'm done. Kill me. I prophesied against them and now my prophecy ain't going to come true. That's what, remember what we read before? Take my life. I beseech thee, for it's better for me to die than to live. Man, Jonah was somebody. He could have been a member of the Ku Klux Klan. There's some of them folks feel like that. They hate, people hate people so bad, they don't want to see them get saved. They want to see them go to hell. What kind of prophet of God is that? Listen, I want, to, I, want, I want to wake you up. Man, there's some folks sitting in church feel like that. Amen. Hopefully not this one. <laughs> okay. I've, I've, I've told this friend, I've told this story. Maybe you've probably heard it before, but a friend of mine I used to work with, uh, I told him, you know, he was asking me about my church. I said, we're Pentecostal. We believe in speaking in tongues and baptism of the Holy Ghost. He says, oh, my... My wife has, a, has an uncle that lives down in Alabama. He has, he has a Pentecostal church. I said, yeah? He says, yeah. He says, yeah, man, they have, you know, they speak in tongues. I mean. He said, but they hate black people. I said, I said, excuse me? He says, yeah, they hate them. They grit their teeth. And, I mean, he was using the words, you know. He was like, mm. I said, that ain't Christ. That ain't Christian. To hate. That ain't. I mean, I don't know. You know, I don't know about them. I'm going to judge them. But, you know, that ain't. That's not what Jesus wants. 
Jonah said, kill me. Because these people I hate, I knew you would save them. God, I knew you would do it. The Lord taught him a lesson. I'm, I'm, I'm getting behind myself here. Amen, amen. Okay. Now, look at the lesson. Hold on. Okay. Then said the Lord, you think, you think it's good that you're angry, Jonah? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. And there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. He got, up, got himself up on the hill and figured he'd watch what was going on. And the Lord God prepared a gourd. And made it to come up and grow over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. God provided a covering for him, shade from the sun. But then God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, should you be angry, Jonah? Doest thou well to be angry? And he said, I got every right to be angry. That's what he said. And Jonah was something. I wonder if Jonah was saved. I don't know. Okay. He was something. And the Lord said, you know what? You care more about that gourd I covered you with than you do with the lives of people. He said, should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons and cannot discern between their right hand and their left and also much cattle? And it ends right there. It just stops right there. But here's what God's saying. He's saying, listen, we care more about our stuff than we do about people. And we, we find ourselves in that position. We care more about our pride. We care more about our position. We care more about what people think about our reputation. We care more about our stuff. What do we think about these people who were created in the image of God? Every one of us in this room was created in the image of God. We're all an individual soul that Jesus Christ died for. And if that's true with us, it's true with every one of them out there. People you like, people you don't like, people who you might not want to hang out with, people that offend you, people that scare you, people that are a threat to you, all created in the image of God. And every one of them, Jesus died for if they accept him. Every one of them. Can you remember back to the time when you were unlovely? When people didn't want to see you come around? If they seen you coming, they'd walk the other way? Remember when the teachers didn't want you in their class? I do. (laughs) Teachers didn't want me in their class. You You take them. Folks don't want to hang out with you. There was a time when you were unlovely. But you know what? Somebody took the time to share God's word with you. Somebody took the time, maybe a perfect stranger, to say, hey, listen, let me tell you about Jesus. There's a, there's a Nineveh out there. You know, out there, that's a Nineveh. You know what? God wants to show his mercy to Nineveh. He wants to show. The mission field's on the other side of this door. It's down at the bottom of the steps. It's across the ocean. Wherever there's human beings is a mission field. And we're all called to be a missionary. Maybe at the bottom of the steps, maybe in Asia wherever it might be. But we're all called to be witnesses. And sad to say, 
There's a lot of folks like Jonah. I, I can't be bothered. I'm, they cause their own problems. That's their own fault. Nineveh caused their own problems. God wants us to be ambassadors. He wants us to be bearers of light to a lost and dying world. Whether it be at the bottom of the steps, or whoever it might be. He doesn't call us to like everybody. He calls us to love everybody. The Apostle Paul, we all know that story. We all keep going back to Paul. He's, I like talking about Paul. He hated the Christians. He went out to try to arrest them. Hated them. Wanted to get them off the street. Thought he was doing God a favor. Yet God knocked him to the ground. Took his sight off of him. And said, Paul, how long are you going to flee from me? I think it's interesting, and I'm just, I'm just going to close with this. Jonah got in a boat to flee. Paul got in a boat to go. The story in the book of Acts. When Paul, they had arrested Paul, and, and the, the, the Jews were accusing him of so much. And uh, Paul says, I appeal to Caesar. And the, and the Roman uh, governor there said, Paul, we could let you go if you hadn't appealed to Caesar. Interesting, when Jonah got in his boat, they had to throw him overboard. When Paul got in his boat and they hit a storm, everybody was going to jump overboard. Paul said, stay on the ship. Stay on the ship. God has a purpose. See, Jonah was running from God's purpose. Paul was in the center of God's will. And he ended up fulfilling what God wanted him to fulfill. I want to ask you tonight. We're just going to close in prayer. And and, uh, How many of you have been running from God's will? How many have turned their head? Turned their back? How many have spent some time in the belly of a big fish? Maybe not literally, but you all know what I mean. I want to be in the center of God's will. You know what I'm I'm finding out? And I just... When we spend time in his presence, he lets his will be made known. And the more time we spend in his presence, the more we're, we're willing the more pliable we are. I'm going to pray tonight. We're going to close it. And, and if anybody has anything I want to say after I pray, we're going to pray. And then afterwards, if anybody needs prayer, I know some have asked for prayer tonight. We, we, want, we want to have prayer. If you need prayer for anything at all, uh, we want to take some time and pray. But before we do, I just want to pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Father, that as Jonah fled from your face, because of his own uh, hatred of the people that you loved. You were merciful to him. Father, as a, as a, as a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, you, you took that, that disobedience of his and you, and you turned that into a prophetic uh, picture that Jesus referred to as a sign of who he is. And Father, you, you've shown us your love and you've given us a lesson in this, in this little prophet of Jonah. That your love is so much greater and all you call us to do is to be obedient. Father, I thank you, Lord, that your mercy is great because we live in a nation that is in great need of your mercy. We live amongst the people of unclean lips, Father. Father. We live amongst the people who have rejected you, a nation, a culture that has turned its back on you in so many ways. Yet your spirit is still alive and well in the United States of America. 
and you still have your body of believers in this country, in this place. Father, first of all, I want to repent of the times that we have turned our back on you. And when I say we, I don't mean just the people in this room, but I mean your church, your body. There have been so many times that we've gone after foolish things and have forgotten the important things. Father, I ask you, Lord, to use us for your glory. Father, so many people need to hear your gospel. I pray for the people on these streets. Father, so many are lost and they've not heard. They, they may have heard a little here, a little there, maybe even been in church. But I pray, Lord, that we would be anointed to speak your word, not just what we think or what we want or our opinions, but your anointed word would be spoken through us and the seed of the word of God would be planted in their hearts. I pray for our family members tonight that aren't saved, for our loved ones, our children, our parents. Lord, that you would break their hearts that they might receive the word and give us the boldness and the courage not to be afraid to speak your word in love and in truth. Father, we're looking for a harvest Father, we need a harvest. And I'm not just speaking for this congregation, but I mean the body of Christ in this city, in this state, in this. Father, we need to see a harvest. We don't know how long we have before you return. Father, I pray, God, that we would use our time wisely in sharing your gospel to a lost and dying world. We ask these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And all God's children said, amen. amen. Any questions or comments before we close tonight? Um, I do want to invite, if in, if we're going to close in prayer. If you need prayer for anything, please come forward. Uh, and uh, my wife and, and myself, and we would love to pray with you. Uh, okay? If anybody would like to make an offering to Brother John as he prepares to go on this uh, missions trip, you may do so. Okay? All right? All hearts and minds clear? Praise the Lord. Why don't you stand with me? Father, as we uh, go from this place but not your presence, we give you glory and honor. Father, use us for your glory. Help us tell somebody about Jesus this week. Father, help us reach out to a lost and dying soul this week. Father, put somebody in our path that we might share your word. Give them the hope of the gospel. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. And all God's children say, amen. amen. Shake somebody's hand and greet each other. In the name of the Lord.